So hey everyone and welcome to the first official vlog for the Qualitative Election Study of Britain 2015. I'm Christy Winters. I'm Edzia Carvalho. And we are really excited and also really tired to be here today. <laughs> Right. Um, right, so very, very quickly before we get started, um, the study ha was, uh, we were awarded the study at the end of February, um, which was like, what, six weeks ago? Less than that. And we have inten been intending to vlog uh, basically since the start of the project. Unfortunately, we, ha we had mostly to put this project together. And so this was really our first opportunity to do a, a vlog on the study. And it today is the first day after the first leaders debate. So our official kickoff vlog is um, after the first time we've collected data. And I think it might be uh, a little bit helpful for us to tell you guys where we've come from and where we are and where we're going and on this vlog, we're going to focus on the leaders' debates because it's ended up being its own thing. So, Azia, do you want to talk a little bit about the original idea for the leaders' debates? And then maybe we can talk about what happened in terms of actually organizing it. So, yeah, um, the original idea for the leaders' debates focus groups came from the QESP 2010, which Christy, of course, did. Um, and what she did then was um, arrange the focus groups on either side of the three leaders' debates. So um, have um, all the three focus groups uh, around the leaders' debates held in Essex, um, in Colchester, um, and have people come in to talk about their expectations of the leaders, their impressions of the leaders, before uh, the uh, leaders' debates, have them watch the leaders' debates, and then have a post-debate session on um, new impressions, if any, were formed. How did uh, how did the participants think the leaders performed, and so on. So it was quite a very well structured design, and it gave us a lot of rich data on either side of the um, leaders' debates that we could draw on and see if there were any changes in perceptions. This way, we could also capture what later came to be called Clegg mania, mm -hmm. and this idea that um, in the initial impressions, Nick Clegg didn't really... Your internet connection. <laughs> <laughs> While we're yeah. recording. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, to obviously edit this out. Yeah. So I think you picked it up on... Uh, yeah, uh, on, on Clegg mania. Clegg mania. Um, and uh, the fact that participants initially didn't really have um, a lot of, um, let's say, leadership impressions about Nick Clegg, um, and then they found his uh, performance quite refreshing once they had seen it uh, in all the three uh, leaders' debates. So that's how we plan on uh, organizing the leaders' debates focus groups this time around, assuming, quite naively it turns out, <laughs> that it would follow the same pattern, because in our view at least, it worked out quite well the last time. So, right, yeah. but what happened was, um, debates being a new thing in Britain, they are also something that can be contested. There's no tradition to sort of guide how things are done. For instance, in the United States, there's a presidential debates commission, and they set the dates and the rules and the moderators and the questions are set, and, and it's all done outside of sort of the candidate's ability to control it much beyond some of the bits, you know, um, within the debates themselves. But here we've in my opinion, you basically had David Cameron throwing his weight around um, and trying to get a debate format that was profitable for him. And what it meant was that we didn't really have a final structure for the debates until basically the, the study was already going. And that meant we had to scramble because the biggest change, well, there were a lot of biggest changes actually. Like, so some among the biggest changes were, um, they were gonna have a seven-way debate, which is what we did it last night. Then they're going to have a challengers debate with four parties and then a, a final discussion, but not really debate with the three leaders of the, the main three main parties. The other major change that messed up our methodological structure or our research design was that they have the debates go, well, at least the first one went for two hours which meant it started at 8 and ended at 10. And there was simply no way we could expect people to reasonably stay until 10.30 at night, participating in a focus group and having the energy and the mental stamina to do that. So it was like, okay, what are we going to do? <laughs> and... Yeah, so well, I guess we quite 
quickly realized that we would have to um, have a lot of the discussion before the leaders debate and find some way of um, gathering data while the participants were watching the leaders debate uh, because again we didn't want to um, add on to the post debate session partly because we didn't think we would get participants who would be willing to spend more uh, nearly three and a half hours um, for the incentives that we were offering them which are not a lot um, so um, so we actually spent quite a lot of time brainstorming and thinking about um, what the first part of the session, the focus group session would consist of and, and how could we gather data while the leaders debate is playing out live and, and participants are watching it. And that was kind of the challenge of this. The other aspect of it was uh, last time we could compare apples to apples because we had the three, three same people um, in basically the same format and they were getting participants in the same city and they were all kind of reacting to the same dynamics. Whereas this time we have a seven way debate and a four way debate and a three way discussion. Um, and, you know, the challengers debate is might have relevance, you know, um, for some people in England, Scotland and Wales um, who would otherwise not see the debate. But if you're not, you're going to exclude the Labour and the Lib Dem and the Conservatives from that debate process, does it make sense for us to recruit people from those parties who have no intention, who have already made up their minds to vote for the three main parties? I mean, are they even going to watch the debates? So it, it just became kind of obvious that the leaders' debates weren't what they were. <laughs> Maybe they never were what they were. And what we decided to do in order to make the data relevant and theoretically um, interesting for academics and others who are going to be looking at our data is to just go with the flow and let the leaders debates be leaders debates let them be their um, let them have the context of whatever location that they're in let them reflect the views of the people in that nation so rather than trying to make something that was kind of a cookie cutter and in, in all honesty the last set of leaders debates did not address the concerns of people in Wales and Scotland nearly enough if at all uh, so we decided to let that national variegation just be part of the data set. And rather than trying to fit the leaders' debates, which are this really odd duck now, into the main data set, we were making it its own data set that is still compatible with the main study. And our, our way to achieve that was to get broad representation in Scotland of Scottish voters. And when we talk about this particular focus group, we're going to talk about how Scottish participants and Scottish voters felt. And when we talk about the next one in Cardiff, um, we'll talk about how Cardiff people in Cardiff and Wales felt and, and English people in England. And our hope is probably we might see some general patterns where we can talk about people who watch the debates. But it is quite likely that we'll just talk about the Scottish debate watchers or the Welsh debate watchers in those contexts. So we uh, had um, the challenge then of how then we made that decision um, once we decided to let the debates be whatever they were going to be in the nation they were going to be held in then the question became all right we have the seven way leaders debate it is the only time david cameron will be stepping on stage to be articulating his policies and defending his positions with all of his rivals we know scotland is not representative of the rest of the uk so how do we get representative representativeness in our broad um, group of people and we decided we were just gonna have to recruit like crazy so given the priorities of the seven person seven way debates we made the commitment to get uh, the widest number of participants in this focus group so that we had data from people from a range of views and do you want to talk a little bit about how we recruited yeah so we decided that um, we wanted to get uh, people who expressed partisan um, leanings at least if not a strong partisan identity uh, with as many of the uh, parties that were going to be represented by the leaders on stage during the seven-way debate and initially we actually thought that was going to be really difficult mm -hmm. because uh, because we are at the moment in Dundee and Dundee has become in the last couple of years very much uh, an SNP um, leaning at least um, location so we were not very sure how much, um, how successful we would be, but we said, let us give it a short and, and try and get as broad uh, a sample of partisans and non-partisans 
um, as possible and so uh, we use the techniques that we've done in the past so we sent out press releases uh, through our university um, we pub we asked um, um, the university uh, well our my department's um, internet officer <laughs> to communications officer to um, post information about the focus groups online um, I circulated information through the small ads uh, mailing list of the university and um, this was basically uh, picked up by local press and um, ended up with it being publicized on the local radio and the local newspapers and um, because of this push uh, and of course we used a lot of tweeting um, so that was basically me tweeting mm -hmm. to 10 15 times a day that there are these focus groups and that uh, you know that we want participants from in and around Dundee um, essentially what that meant is we got a pool of about um, I would say close to about 70 uh, potential participants. Yeah, okay, you just said that this is amazing. And I wanted to just say, like the difference, uh, well, in 2010, I um, was, well, one, one on my own, and so it's so much better to have a competent, friendly, supportive, wonderful <laughs> research partner. It makes life so much easier to have a great partner, a team, you know, that um, we work together. Um, but, and, and it's been so much, our recruitment strategy has evolved a lot since 2010. So I really used like the internal email systems of the universities and then from that a snowballing um, and referral system. So the idea would be to try to get somebody who worked somewhere in the university to refer one of their friends who was a missing category. Um, you know, maybe they were unemployed or they were a working mom or working dad, that kind of thing. So I would give one person 10 pounds if they recommended someone who meet, met those criteria in order to get a broadly representative sample. But this time, but this time, <laughs> um, we are, social media has just been, it's transformed how people communicate. And the other thing too is, uh, yeah, I didn't realize probably at the time, um, the, the, the local Colchester press probably would have picked up on it just because I think local newspapers are dying for free press releases about things that are happening locally that ties to a national story, it gives them basically everything they want. So the ability to use the university's press office as staff rather than just like a PhD student who's doing or a postdoc student. Um, it has been very helpful because we do get like Adzia was on the radio, uh, which will be on the radio today. Yeah. And, <laughs> and this is like the, you were on the radio for peps yeah twice twice and this is the second time for the qesb yeah and we were in the local paper um, i'm just i don't even have it all right <laughs> uh, here it is page 27 uh this was for the peps event but yeah they did a whole page on our research yeah <laughs> ah! <laughs> we're happy um so that has uh, not only been great in terms of exposure for the study, but it's also meant that uh, people who hear it and are like, oh, I could use 40 quid or I could use 30 quid and I've got opinions, um, are self-selecting. You know, they're bringing themselves forward. So yeah, you had this pool of, of 70 respondents. Just so. about, yeah. And um, um, to my surprise, many of them were not simply um, SNP supporters, as we initially thought. We had a lot of people who supported other parties uh, to varying degrees, uh, or at least reported supporting other parties. Um, and we got um, all but UKIP supporters um, in um, reporting that they were supporters of these parties. In addition to that, we got people who said that they were not supporters of any parties, but they had decided how they would vote. And we got people who said that they were not supporters of any parties, that they wanted to vote, but they didn't know which party they were going to vote for or which candidate they were going to vote for so we got quite a lovely mix mm -hmm. of people with different um, leanings that allowed us then to choose um, to pick and choose a good sample yeah and that makes all the difference to the data quality uh, and i guess there's a little bit of a preview um, in terms of our group, and this came out, we wrote a press release after the focus group last night, both of us like staring <laughs> like through fuzzy eyes going, does this make sense? Um, no, that was me. You were more awake at that time. But um, we had in our groups that uh, Nicola Sturgis, Sturgeon, sorry, Nicola Sturgeon, I, I, uh, Sturgis, Wisconsin is where I'm from. My default is Sturgis. Nicola Sturgeon and Ed Miliband. 
came out kind of as the top two, which you would is pretty consistent with areas where you get S and P labor support. And then you had a middling category of Cameron and, and Clegg, Clegg um, with uh, there was also I think Wood a, and Bennett. Yeah, also a little bit lower than that. Um, Wood and Bennett were I wouldn't say lower. They just had a completely oh, different. Right. Um, Full range yeah, of marks. Yeah, the full range of marks. <laughs> <laughs> From A to F. Some people yeah. love them, some people didn't work in yeah, so. at all. And then, uh, but Nigel Farage. Nigel Farage was at the bottom. C in lowers, yeah. basically. Yeah. Um, so we felt like that is um, quite representative of the area. And that in that way, it, it, our, our, we have confidence our data is reflecting, you know, if we had UKIP lovers or everybody thought David Cameron did brilliant, I think we'd be a lot more suspicious of our own data yeah but and I think the point that you made earlier is that um, what the so if you haven't uh, already seen this the polls on the leaders debates are all over the place mm -hmm. um, and nobody can make sense of why they're all over the place and Christy hit on it which is they are not taking into account um, the countries and they're treating everything as if it's homogenous and it's not anymore <laughs> Oh, there's a cat, cat behind. behind. One moment. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so what they really need to do is who performed better in Scotland and who performed better in Wales and who performed better in England. And I think a lot of that noise would then shake out and it wouldn't be so weird as to why Nicola and Nigel <laughs> ended up being some of the biggest uh, people who were perceived to have won the debates. I think it depends on, you know, where you sit depends or where you stand yeah. depends on where you sit. Again, an artifact of the two and a half party system. This assumption that everybody's actually quite close together. Yes. Um, and therefore it should make sense because everybody anywhere in the UK is going to perceive those parties uh, in a in a very similar way right right as if we're all one that we're all the median voter yeah or something yeah yes um generally the recruitment did very went very well and Adia was allowed as able to we got basically uh, tried to get two of every party and then we had some problems with drop-offs but that allowed us because we had such a deep pool to replace as much as possible like for like uh, the other thing that was exciting that we've done since getting the grant award is you, Adia, saw an email from a PhD student who was doing experimental research on the use of social media during the leaders' debates as part of her research, doctoral research at the University of Dundee. And we just thought, well, one, this is a great opportunity to unite two people, you know, two research areas um, that obviously have a lot of commonality. And for us, I know it's, in, I think we have a commitment to mentoring young academics who show, you know, interest and um, have a great ideas. So we've partnered with her. And do you want to talk a little bit about how, because you were with her more and probably chatted more about the experiment and how it was going. So. Uh -huh, I didn't. Okay. But, all right. <laughs> but that's because I was in my, yeah, oh, yes. I need to go to the focus all right, so you... <laughs> But anyway, uh, yeah. So what we did uh, was meet with her a couple of times and find out what her experiment was. And her experiment is essentially is uh, the political version of Gogglebox uh, in a way. So basically she would like to um, record people while they are watching political events on television. And the way she's starting out is by recording people watching the leaders debates in the current general election and later on she has plans to record people while they are watching question time or uh, prime minister's questions or whatever so because the leaders debates uh, aspect of her research very much overlapped with our own own and and at this time we were trying to find ways in which we could collect data mm -hmm. while uh, participants were watching the leaders debates we thought that this would be a good way to try and um, solve our data problems yeah. <laughs> uh, as well yeah. as um, solve her data problems <laughs> <laughs> everybody wins yes um, so um, what we did yesterday then was to um, get two participants um, for the focus groups who would be doubling up as her research participants they would wear a camera on their lapel which would record what they were doing while they were watching the leaders debates and essentially uh, what she's really interested in is to look at how they use the internet and how they use social media while they are watching the leaders debates um, so uh, so she was uh, at the back of the room with us watching the other participants making notes uh, she was also noting what um, participants who were not officially part of her research group were doing because there were many people there 
who were tweeting and using the internet even though they were not necessarily part mm -hmm. of her research group so that also gave her additional data and she made contacts with them as well to follow up for subsequent uh, leaders debates yeah she was very very happy I yeah think. she was like on air last night <laughs> i can't believe all the data i got <laughs> she's very very happy yeah. and speaking about solving the data collection problem so that was our first attempt to try to figure out okay we we're going to have people in a room for two hours we're going to be paying them and feeding them. <laughs> They're going to be sat watching TV. Um, that's great for them, but how do we get data out of them? You know, because otherwise we have a space of, we, we pay them for an hour's worth of chatting and then watching TV for two hours and they go home. And obviously that's not very sensible for us. So we had had some discussions about allowing people to take notes and using either um, some kind of a recording devices that people could talk into, although that would have been kind of awkward or having a camera run behind the the where the food was so that basically there was a camera running there and every time someone went back to get refreshments or something to eat we would sort of eavesdrop on the conversation they were having knowing that they were being recorded because they had informed consent so they knew it was going to be recorded but then um, I think we just sort of like the idea merged together where I said we should give them report cards basically a, a way to evaluate every single leader and then Adzia came up with this really lovely report card that was much better than <laughs> I had in mind and then we can get some examples so, um, here's someone who didn't have much to say about Nick Clegg apparently so oh it's on, on the back so this is a blank side so uh, alright I guess maybe it makes a little bit more sense if I bring it up here uh, so what we have here is basically we've got the picture of the leaders because there were seven people and there was the for people in Scotland they didn't know really who the Plaid Cymru person was and they also didn't really know unnecessarily who the Green Party was so there's a picture here with the person and then there's the topic so if it's the topic is education or Im immigration or national health or whatever else or they, personality I mean they didn't pick that up but the reason I said topic was also because they could have just commented on the personality or oh. on the a way they were speaking or whatever Anything. but nobody seemed to have picked up on that <laughs> <laughs> um but uh, yeah well for us in organization wise i was thinking topics as in subjects because it makes it so much easier yeah. to organize than it thematically like how did mm. nick clegg perform in immigration com yeah. across the room yeah. uh and then a, a place for comments uh and you can see here uh, i'll kind of bring it out a little bit but people did spend quite a lot of time writing lots and lots of comments um, and then an overall mark for that section. They have a final mark where they were um, asked to give them an overall grade and a few comments as to why they gave the overall grade that they did. That worked so much better than I thought it was going to work. It worked so yeah. well. Yeah. You want to? Yeah, because firstly, I don't think we expected people to write as much as they did. And they were writing diligently and mm -hmm. scribbling away and... Um, Flipping it, through, looking for the right person that they wanted yeah. to make the comment yeah. on. There were some people, because of the way that the debate was structured yesterday, it was structured into opening statements, four questions, um, and then closing statements. And I was, uh, as I was going through some of the comments that people had made, there were some participants who actually used that structure for their uh, comments. So you have opening statements, question number one, <laughs> question number two. It was incredible how diligent our participants <laughs> yeah. were. Yeah, they were great. Really good. Yeah. Um, we did have four participants of the 15 who didn't um, give the leaders a final grade. But that was, a, um, I mean, that was a relatively small sample. So um, it didn't affect our um, our Overall, data yeah. as much. Yeah. If only like two, a half of them had done that or something, it would probably be a little less yeah. um, concerning. But yeah. yes, with four. Yeah. Um, right. Then... Like a brain freeze. Oh. It's just been a really long week for both of us. <laughs> oh, we're almost done. Yeah, I think um, the only. So thing I think the only thing is uh, how we are proceeding with the rest of the debates, and then what we have learned. Oh, one last yeah, one last thing. Um, one last thing on the structure of the debates. One thing we offered, which I think was fine and, and polite, and it didn't really hurt our data in any way, was that in order to encourage participation, if we had people who had childcare needs or other time demands, we did offer them the ability to leave 30 minutes before the, the end of the debate in order to do like a 15 minute focus group or a 30 minute focus group depending on how many people decided to, to, to leave early, to bung off. Um, and we only had three uh, people out of 15 who wanted to leave early. So we did a quick wrap up, actually two of them were students. I think they just had student-y things like to do because it's finals and papers and stuff or whatever, getting out of town. Um, 
but most people were quite happy to stay until 10 and then we changed it up a little bit the initial idea because what with 15 people i guess we should say right so i was on the seven and then the two and oh 15 all right so with with 15 people in order to get that spread of undecided and partisans from as many parties as we could get we split the focus groups groups <laughs> focus groups up into two uh, we had uh, the undecided and the lone Tory in one group, and then we had everybody else in, in my group. And we did that in order to uh, obviously make the most of the time. We only had one hour, and it's very difficult to get uh, a lot of information out of 15 people in 60 minutes. You can get responses, you can get reactions, but you can't get thoughts mm -hmm. with that little time. And the other thing was that we decided was to do most of the data collection about opinions about the leaders and the predictions about performances and predictions about the debate beforehand and then afterwards we organized the questions in such a way that the ones that were sort of the obvious easy ones that we thought would take very little time were first so uh, initially we asked people oh yeah some questions again about perceptions and then perceptions at the end and i think it all flowed very well i mean i would have loved another 15 minutes but of course i would but generally people were still very enthusiastic willing to answer questions it was actually kind of hard to get them out of there because we were on a time mm -hmm. thing and i think they wanted to talk more they probably yeah. would have gone for another 15 yeah. minutes willingly yeah um, but we were on a time and we had to get the room sorted out and shut down and so yeah yeah but it, it went really well i think even um the post um debate session which was only 15 minutes and it was very much a general can you raise your hands and tell us what you thought about this or that um, but even that was a uh, good data because it gave us a sense of where the participants were and luckily for us i think a lot of the participants were on the same page mm -hmm. um, as well so there wasn't that much dissension in terms of their impressions exactly yeah i think um so and we put this in our press release most people thought the debate was very was pretty fair uh well moderated there were some people who said oh you know i wish she would have let people answer but i understood she had to keep the um the things going and that and that the debates were a good thing that they they did enjoy them and that they were glad they watched them and that they should continue in future elections so I don't think that's really spoiling too much of our findings. Uh, it's just good governance. I think the debates are generally seen as as, as accountability and mm. good governance. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Right. All right. So what have we learned? Oh, all right. Yeah. So Edzia, <laughs> from from your like running the focus groups last night, what did you learn? I have to get into my teacher mode <laughs> yeah. to keep the focus groups uh, on track and to keep participants. Uh, chatting away and to make sure everybody has um, the, an equal amount of time to express their views. Mm. Okay. So, yeah, that's what I learned. Okay. What I learned is um, I am not capable of logging on the same day that we're going to do a focus group. And the main reason isn't so much like time and stress, it's that my battery, if I use my battery in my camera, I don't have a backup battery. And so I think, like, well, I could vlog now, but then I've got to charge it up. And then it can, if we're charging it while we're doing the room, is it's not finished. And data always becomes more important. So I think we're probably going to be, when we're vlogging, we're probably, you're probably going to see us vlogging on trains. Like you're probably going to mm -hmm. see us like filming each other back and forth on trains or in hotel rooms the day before, the day after. Um, not so often on the day of because it's just uh, too intense, too crazy. Um, if we had uh, you know some volunteers who could film us but since it's just the two of us i think we're probably going to be doing vlogs before and after uh, so that was it um, um did, what have you learned from our focus groups uh, i think we already kind of mentioned some of the things about the de debates being a good thing yeah yes debates being a good thing um also the question on selfies was very generational Mm. Um, so I think if we, so we had a little icebreaker where we might do a press release again on this in a bit, uh, so, I don't know when, someday, not today, uh, that, about having a selfie taken. And I think we, should, we probably should have said a selfie or a photo because there were like older respondents who just said, I don't even know what a selfie is. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, and it reminded me that I have to not always assume everyone has the same lingo or the same access to te technology um, even though quite a lot of people do and I don't want to be prejudiced a lot of our peps people 
were more tech savvy and you know were online and knew things about uh, resources that I didn't know about. Mm. But there's also an assumption and I shouldn't be quite so you know think about it from multiple points of view. Mm. And I think what I learned from the focus groups was how important a good sample is. Um, I think that the success of our focus groups was because we spent so much time making sure that the criteria on which we select people are robust enough to be defended mm -hmm. in a journal article, for example. Um, and, and I think that made all the difference. If that we didn't go, um, although a lot of, it was a convenient sample to a certain extent, but actually we didn't go with the first person. Mm -hmm. Who applied like you had told me right so don't go for the first person yeah. Who <laughs> um, yeah and I think that part of that is because of panic because you're not sure mm -hmm. who's going to apply how many people are going to apply and how long you should wait before making your decision on on your sample yeah. and so that that's a difficult waiting period it's a dance yeah you know because on the one hand you might have someone drop out um, and then you go ah it's the day before I can't get anybody and the first person who says yes Yes, you t say, okay, show up. And then the next day over your lunch hour, you get an email from a person who would be a perfect candidate, but they g you gave the slot away six hours ago because you were in a panic. And um, But, I mean, there's also, you, you can't also go back and second guess yourself. You mm. turn down a perfectly good person who's a replacement and you don't get that next person. Mm. But um, I think you're right. I think that our next, moving forward, the most important thing for us is now going to be blitzing tar uh, Cardiff and getting the study all over Cardiff and getting people to click on the links on Twitter, click on the links on Facebook, whatever else, uh, pass it on to their granny, uh, say you should sign up for this or can I sign you up for this Nan, those kinds of things. Mm. So, Great. yeah. That's it then. All right, so we're going to go be tired <laughs> <laughs> and stare off into space mid-distance for a while. Um, but yes, uh, there will be a talk here on this channel that I gave at the Political Studies Conference, Political Association, Political Studies Association <laughs> Conference this week where I discussed the research design and the final version of the research design that we're operating from right now. So you can look forward to that as well if it's not already up, depending on how complicated it is. And then probably the, the next event. time... Hmm? Yeah. The Pepsi event as well. Oh yes, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And the other thing that's on our channel, you should definitely, definitely watch this if you've already made it to the end of this video, you're committed to this kind of stuff anyway, um, is the talk, uh, our pep talk. Okay, our stuff is good. But Mark Shepard's talk is brilliant, and Stephen Hope, he, he also, from Ipsos Mori, Edinburgh, who got seconded down to London for um, the general election. I mean, mm -hmm. this guy knows his stuff. He's, mm -hmm. he's good. He gave a great talk on the problems of measuring referendums and why polling companies had such a, a, a range of um, estimates in terms of how the vote would turn out. And he just gives a really sensible, well-grounded, empirical talk. And I think everybody should watch it. So, Pep's talk, the QESB research design, uh, this one, and then probably the next time we'll meet up will be before the Cardiff um, uh, focus, group. focus groups on the 16th, so we'll probably be recording again like around the 15th of April. So, from me, Christy. And me, Adia. We'll see you guys next time. Bye. Bye. Bum bum bum! <laughs>